all right? Uh, about maybe three weeks ago on Sunday evening, I preached a sermon um, entitled Call No Man Father. Call No Man Father. And I was preaching against the Roman Catholic Church. Well, this is going to be a part two to that sermon. Now, <clears throat> a lot of times when independent Baptists stand up to preach a sermon against the Roman Catholic Church, people kind of will glaze over because they've heard so many sermons against the Roman Catholic Church. And it's something that independent Baptists just spend a ton of time on. Now, we need to be well-rounded, but we also need to make sure that we don't just avoid preaching against false churches and false religions out there. And you may be fooled into thinking that the Roman Catholic Church has you know, uh, uh, diminished in numbers. Now, they have diminished in power. That's obvious. If we look back at you know, the Roman Catholic Church being a the theocracy in Europe, they have d diminished in power, no doubt, but they have not diminished in numbers. I looked up statistics in my office just a moment ago. There are 1.3 billion Catholics in the world today. There are 9 billion people in the world today. 1.3 of them subscribe and say, I am a Catholic. That is an ast that's an astounding number. That's huge. When you knock on doors, constantly, what do they tell you? I'm Catholic. I'm Catholic. We hear it all the time. So this is something that needs to continually be dealt with. Right. Bible-believing Christians have been fighting the Roman Catholic Church for centuries. They've been persecuted. They've been killed. The Roman Catholic Church has shed more blood of Bible-believing Christians than any other institution since Jesus Christ has been on this earth. And that's a fact. So they, they need to be continually dealt with. And what I'm going to do tonight, the title of the sermon, is Pagan Roots of Catholicism. I'm going to take the Bible. Because we call them pagans all the time, right? I'm going to take the Bible tonight. I'm going to show you that there are key identifiers of a pagan. And I'm going to define the word pagan for you right now in just a moment. There are key identifiers of a pagan. And I'm going to show you that the Roman Catholic Church meets every single last one of them. Now, I want you to look here in Judges chapter number 18. Judges chapter number 18. <clears throat> Verse number 19, I believe it is. Verse 8, yeah, yeah. It is chapter number 18, verse number 19. <clears throat> it says, And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it, is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a, a priest unto a tribe and a family? In Israel. Now, we don't need the context, but I'm going to point something out in this particular verse in just one moment. <clears throat> but I want to make this statement quickly. If you ever speak to a Catholic, their primary argument to validate that they are the true Christian church is that we are the oldest church. How many, who, who's heard that before? They repeatedly, and they say they can tr trace their uh, you know, uh, spiritual genealogy of their pope back to Peter, which I debunked that last week. He was not even in Rome. That's not what the Bible teaches. He stayed in Jerusalem. But that's what they'll say. But, but actually, the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church goes back much further than that. And I'm going to prove that to you. They have their roots much further back than just Peter. They don't have roots with Peter, but much further back than when Peter lived on this earth. I want you to look right here in verse number 19 again. I want you to notice <clears throat> what statement this man makes. It says, And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, and go with us. And notice what he says, And be to us a father and a priest. Now, isn't that interesting? The priests that were instituted in the Bible, were they ever referred to as a father? Ever? No, no. They were not, were they? But notice what this man says, Be to us a father and a priest. So what are they going to refer to this priest as? Father. And like I preached, and I'm not going to go over any of that, but the Bible teaches call no man father upon the, on the earth. Now, in this passage, this particular man was serving as, you know, a, 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 he was an invalid, an, a, a, a not a legitimate priest for this one man, you know, uh, that, that uh, his name was Micah, right, at Micah's house. He was illegitimate. And this man being this, this man's priest, this Levite, he was what they were worshiping idols as well. He was a priest unto him, and they were keeping idols, right? So you have a priest here that is, that is ministering unto this man, and they are referring to him as father. Now, what church today could you identify that with? 
I mean, it doesn't that, if, what if I said today, hey, you know, there's this religion, they have a priest, they call him father, and they worship idols. What would you say? I mean, is that even a problem at all? There's no one else that even comes to mind in that sense, doesn't it? Just because of 1.3 billion, because it's, there's such big, a big influence. Now, I'm going to show you that that consistency is carried all throughout the Bible. That all the same identifiers are always, of the pagan religions of this world, they're always the same. And the same things that the Catholic Church just openly does in their church today that are in contrary, in contradiction to our religion, true biblical Christianity, are actually pagan in origin, over and over again. Now I want to read you the definition of pagan, because paganism, or, or pagan is not a Bible word. Just like this morning, you know, we talk about like an illegal immigrant, right? Well, the Bible uses the word stranger a lot of times, right? It'll use the word foreigner occasionally, but you know, those two words are perfectly synonymous. Well, the word pagan is synonymous with the Bible's word Gentile or heathen. I don't know if everyone remembers, but I proved that Gentile and heathen are synonymous words. They are used synonymously all throughout the Bible. Well, pagan just means the exact same thing. It just means heathen or Gentile. <clears throat> the Wiki this is Wikipedia, Wikipedia's definition of paganism. It is a term first used in the 4th century by early Christians for populations of the Roman Empire who practice polytheism. That is right off the bat what it says. The, the Roman Empire, 4th century, who practiced polytheism, okay? It says this, alternate terms in Christian texts for the same group were Helen, Gentile, and heathen. Those are the words that we would find in the Bible. So when we see heathen, Gentiles, or when heathens or Gentiles are being discussed, what are they? They're pagans. Everyone understand that thus far? says this, modern pagan traditions often incorporate beliefs or practices, and this is the same in the Bible as well, we'll see that in a moment, such as nature worship, that are different from those in the largest world's religions. Contemporary knowledge of old pagan religions comes from several sources, including anthropological, that's the study of man, is what that word means, field research records, the, ev the evidence of archaeological artifacts, and the historical accounts of ancient writers regarding cultures known to classical antiquity. And then it says this. I wanted to read this. While most pagan religions express a worldview that is pantheistic, that's just the worship of everything, creature, everything, polytheistic or animist, animistic, that's also the worship of creatures and it, with emphasis on animals, but animistic can, is just worship of, of, cre, of uh, creation. It says there are some monotheistic pagans, and it goes on to say almost none, and it goes through a list. They, they almost don't exist. So I wanted to read that for you, just especially so that you understand that pagans are heathens. They are Gentiles when we go to the Bible. Now, <clears throat> I want you to turn. We're going to go just through. We're going to start with the easiest identifiers. And uh, I want you to turn now to Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 4. This is the biggest sore thumb of the Catholic religion. And it is the Roman Catholic religion. And when the Bible, and when uh, we read that just a moment ago, Wikipedia wants to define paganism. It tells you that, the, that what's most commonly thought of and known as paganism is the Roman Empire. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're familiar with the origins of the Roman Catholic Church, but it started from a man named Constantine. He was the Roman emperor of the Roman Empire, right? He was the emperor. He was the king. He was the ruler. Well, supposedly this is how it goes. In the, in the 4th century, you know, he was going forth to battle. And before he was actually in the battlefield, or, or maybe he was in the, I guess he probably was in the battlefield at this time, but before he was in war, before warfare had, had engaged, he looked up into the sky and supposedly saw a vision. And this vision was a sun with a cross. And then he heard, uh, you know, a voice audibly, which he claims to be God, of course, that said, in this conquer, or conquer in this, something along those lines. So, he then went forth and fought this fight and was just, you know, uh, outstandingly victorious. It was, just, it was just amazing, as though it, you know, he had uh, the power of God, the power of Satan is what he had. So, he went back and supposedly because of that converted to Christianity. Now, Constantine was a pagan. There's no doubt about that, he was a pagan. You know, even after, and even historical secular 
uh, or even his secular historians acknowledge that even after his supposed conversion, he continued to worship idols. He continued to worship the sun and was pantheistic. He was pagan. The, the main example of paganism is Greek and Romanism. That's where uh, and, uh, the, the Roman Empire. That's the main example of paganism. So what happened was he, because he was trying to bring peace in his realm or his, em his empire... He basically faked that he had converted to Christianity, started a new version of Christianity, which was his pagan religion mixed with Christianity, which ends up being his pagan religion. Not partially Christianity. It doesn't work like that. It ends up being paganism. And you know what the name of it was? The Roman Catholic Church. That was the beginning and the origin of the Catholic Church as we know it today. That's where it came from, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, <clears throat> the Bible is extremely clear, what we're going to look at right now. Extremely clear about the worshiping of idols and making idols and graven images. I want you to look here in Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 4. Exodus 20 is a very famous chapter because this is the Ten Commandments. Look at Exodus chapter number 20. We'll read... Verse number 4, the Bible says this, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So you're not to make any graven image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Look at verse number 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, for I... The Lord thy God and a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, there are things that are confusing in the Bible, but Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5 is not part of that. It is extremely clear, right? Was that super clear? I'm sure most of the children in here would understand that. You're not to make a graven image. You're not to make an idol of anything. And then you are also not to bow down to that idol. Now, <clears throat> The, any Catholic church that you go in practically has numerous idols in it. I've been in Catholic churches. I've walked in there for you know uh, uh, weddings before. I've walked in there just you know with people just walking in and then walking out just to look at it when they're open and things like that. Who here has been a part of a Catholic church before? Yeah, are there idols within the church that you guys attended? Numerous idols, aren't there? Everywhere, right? There are idols all over. If you go where you know the uh, the uh, uh, where, where's the, I, I just slipped my mind. Where is the, the Pope? Where is he located? The Vatican. the Vatican is what I was thinking of. If you go to the Vatican, yeah, he's in yeah, Rome, but yeah. The, if you go to the Vatican, you've seen pictures of it. It's just, it's just literally permeated with what? Idols everywhere. Everywhere. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has tried to, you know, hide this in a way. And, and if you will go to, you know, a Roman Catholic website or if you were to get, uh, you know, and, and look at their, one of their, their catechism, right? Which is just a constitution of their beliefs. They have their Ten Commandments listed, right? But there's a difference. There's a change. And you know what it is? The Second Commandment is removed out of their Ten Commandments. Was everyone here aware of that? It's totally taken out of the Ten Commandments. And you know what they did to deceive you? It's exactly the same, if you think about this, and I'll tell you, you'll understand in a moment. It's exactly the same as the NIV and all these other verses that change the numbering order of the verses because they're deceiving you. What they do is they take the 10th commandment that you're not to covet your neighbor's wife, you're not to covet your neighbor's ass or anything that's thy neighbor's. Well, they, they make commandment 9, don't covet your neighbor's wife. You know what they make commandment 10? Don't covet your neighbor's ass. Or anything that is thy neighbor's. So, because they still got to have Ten Commandments. But when you open up the Catholic Bible, verses four and five are still there. But those just aren't commandments. There's a clear pattern here when it tells you, Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. You can number the commandments, it's clear there's ten of them. And you know what the second commandment is? Not to make a graven image and not to bow down to it. It's extremely clear. Extremely clear. There's no misunderstanding that. And then you go into a Catholic church which claims to believe the Bible, right? They claim, of course they say they have multiple authorities, but they claim to believe the Bible. You go into a Catholic church and there's idols everywhere. Everywhere. You know what they do? They don't only make idols, they
they bow down to the idols too. And then those bunch of deceiving liars who claim to be biblical Christi Christians, right? They take the Ten Commandments and they just remove a commandment out of it. The commandment that they're just blatantly breaking. And then they split the last commandment, commandment 10, into commandment 9 and 10. What a bunch of liars. Right. You know why? Because they're pagans. They don't really believe the Bible. Why would they act like they did in order to deceive you? That's why. Why would someone just pretend to believe what you believe? Or would there be a religion that is just, just imitating another religion? Because they are liars and they're trying to hurt people and damn people. Right. There really is a plan from the devil in order to infiltrate Christianity, right? And he comes in, well, you know, not Christianity, cr real Christianity, with fake Christianity. And that's what the, the Catholic Church tries to be. It's an imitation of true Christianity. <clears throat> now, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter number 3. We're going we're gonna to go through quickly a couple of things here as well. Now, Daniel chapter number 3, I want to build some points here. <clears throat> Daniel chapter number 3, verse number 1, we're going to see an example of one of the most well-known you know, uh, pagans in the Bible. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. And what does he do? He bows down to idols. He makes an image, right? He makes a statue, even of himself. And not only that, he worships a multiplicity of gods. We're going to see that in just a moment. Look at Daniel chapter number 3, verse number 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. So that's, of course, what we just read. You are not to do. He is not a Christian, right? He made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, <clears throat> the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, govern, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that ne Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud to you. It is commanded all people, nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, this is a perfect example, and he is the ideal example of a pagan. Nebuchadnezzar, everyone realizes that, everyone knows that, that Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen. He was a pagan man. And what do you see him doing? We see him here making an image, having an idol, and setting this up. I want you to go over to Daniel chapter number 4, verse number 8. Daniel chapter number 4, verse number 8. I'll show you that he also believed in a multiplicity of gods. It says in Daniel chapter number 4, verse number 8, But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belt Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. And he says, And in whom is the spirit of the holy gods? Plural. And before him I told the dream, saying, and then he goes on and on. <clears throat> Another good example of a pagan religion or a heathen religion is Egypt, ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt from archaeology, just going back and looking at the remains of ancient Egypt, they were heavily polytheistic. Not only were they polytheistic, they, they were animistic, where they worshipped animals and they just worshipped the sun. They worshipped the creature, right? That is paganism at its core. That, that's a, a, a part of that. Now, what's interesting, this is just a really interesting side note about Israel. When they left, when Israel uh, you know, left and was, and was freed from slavery, they went out to Mount Sinai. And what did they do when Moses tarried in the mountain? What did they have Aaron make for them? A golden calf. Now, where would they have, where would they have heard of that? Think about that. Egypt. Now, there's a, if you want to look this up, I mentioned this, I think, one other time. It's, it, I believe it's pretty solid that they found the, that mountain, Mount Sinai. And at the top of it, it's burnt. And they checked it and sampled it. And it's, it's, you know, it's like scorched black. And it's the exact location map-wise where they were traveling and where they would have been. But not only that, one of the most interesting things is at the bottom there's a structure, a platform of this mountain. And on this platform, it's a large platform that's like six feet. And it, and it lines up, if you look at antiquity, of pagans that would worship false gods and they would have idol, idols and images. They would build platforms and then set their idol on top of this. Well, 
on around the outside of this platform, and like I said, it's, it's four to six feet tall, I don't know exactly how tall, there are, are uh, engravings and little pictures that are drawn on this of a calf, just repeated pictures of a calf. That same exact style calf is only found in one other place. You know where? On walls in Egypt, all over in Egypt. So you see how this line of paganism, what I'm saying, is passed down from one, you know, uh, you know, person or or you know, one group of people to another, and it just continues. There is a line. That's why I say the pagan roots of Catholicism. There is a line of pagan religion that traces all the way back, all through the Bible, all the way back to Babylon, to Egypt, all throughout the Bible, and they always have the same identifiers. I want to show you one of the main identifiers of that. Uh, within the Catholic Church, and it is transubstantiation. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend time on, uh, you know, the, the Catholic Trinity tonight, because I have beat that horse, you know, you know to where you, it's not even recognizable anymore. <laughs> but the, the, the Catholic Trinity is very different than what almost all Christians will claim to believe about the Trinity. The pictures that they drew throughout, you know, the Middle Ages and the pictures that were drawn, you know, during, you know, the 15th, 16th century, all of these are just, they are just, they scream polytheism. Right. They scream, I believe in three gods. Yes. If any person that didn't know of, you know, the, the, their explanation of the Trinity or anything like that within Catholicism, and they were slid a picture of that. Is that mono, monotheistic or polytheistic? What do you think they'd say? Oh, that's monotheistic. They just believe they're sharing the same essence. Are you kidding me? It screams polytheism. Do you know why? Because the Roman Catholic Church is pagan. Because they believe in a multiplicity of God. Now, I'm not like I said. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But that's another element of the Roman Catholic Church. The Orthodox Trinity that is believed by the Catholic Church, that has spread to some Baptist churches, and, and some Baptists have, have, have taken this and, and morphed it in some ways and taught it, the three persons and all of this garbage, that comes from pagan religion. That comes from a worshiping of a multiplicity of gods. And it was, it was Constantine worshiping multiple gods and trying to claim Christianity, mushing these two together. And they don't mix. It's like oil and water. Now, I have you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I'm going to turn to myself, and I'm, I want to read to you quickly what, just so that you're familiar with what transubstantiation is. I'm only going to read really one to two statements off. This is also taken from, from Wikipedia. Transubstantiation, the change of substance, trans just means change, substance, or essence, by which the bread and wine offered in the sacrifice of the sacrament of the Eucharist during the Mass. It says, become... In reality, I want you to hear that, become in reality the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you didn't realize that this is what the Catholic Church believes, or maybe if you just thought that Christianity was misrepresenting the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church in every way truly and legitimately believes that when that priest stands up there and blesses or does whatever he does, to the bread and the wine, you know, the Eucharist there, right? At their, their communion, they believe that something takes place called transubstantiation. That is the change of the nature or the substance of what he is holding. And they believe that it was bread and it was wine, but it is transformed literally. Like it said, in reality, to the literal flesh of Jesus Christ and the literal flesh or the literal blood. Of Jesus Christ. That is blasphemy. Right, right. And I'm going to show you that that is also paganism. That is a pagan practice all throughout the Bible. Now look here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I want you to look at verse number 21 first. <clears throat> it says, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now notice, in the context of communion, he's speaking to those that are the Corinthians. These are, are they live in Corinth. And they are Gentiles in the flesh, right? And he tells them and he warns them, you cannot drink of the Lord's cup and of the devil's cup. You can't be partaker of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. So notice that there is the Lord's table. There is the Lord's cup. The Lord's sacrifice, the Lord's Passover, the Lord's communion. But you know what? The devil also has a communion. 
The devil also has a sacrifice. He also has his Passover, right? The devil always imitates the truth, doesn't he? Well, look at who, the, who, who it's talking about. It says the devil and the Passovers and everything, the sacrifice. Look at what it says in verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. So who are we talking about here? Pagans. Notice it's also referred to in this sense as a sacrifice. If you had been paying attention, the transubstantiation, they refer to it also as a sacrifice. The Catholic Church calls it a sacrifice. And right here it says that it is the Gentiles. And they are sacrificing things to devils. <clears throat> now, this passage they will try to use, we're going to look at a couple of passages here, that they try to use to bolster or support their teaching that... That the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ is present in, you know, their communion or transubstantiation, their Eucharist, if you will. That's one of their seven sacraments. I want you to go up, though, to verse number 16 where this is discussed. <clears throat> Notice what it says. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the sacrifices? Or partakers, excuse me, of the altar. What say I then, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Now notice when these people are sacrificing, what are they sacrificing to? What's brought up again? Idols. All of these things are always present in pagan religion. Always. All at the same time. And what do you see? A communion of the devil, right? A, a, a uh, you know, sacrifice or Passover, like I said, of the devil's table where they sacrifice something and they claim that it's what? Do they say this is, you know, to the devil? No, of course they say it's to God, don't they? Now, one thing that I want to point out to you here in verse number 16, you'll notice that this is the communion of the blood of Christ. It's the communion of the blood of Christ. Is it the blood of Christ? No, it's the communion of the blood of Christ. You notice that? Not only that, it says it's the communion of the body of Christ. It's not the body of Christ. It's the communion of the body of Christ. Now, that's just a small point real quick. Then we see in verse number 17, For we being many are one, what? Bread. Now, <clears throat> I want you to turn, while we have that in mind, over to Matthew chapter number 26. And we'll see where this actual false teaching comes from. 26. Uh, Matthew 26. Where this false teaching comes from, <clears throat> where they claim that Jesus Christ literally gave his blood and his flesh to his disciples to eat. Matthew chapter number 26. I want you to look at verse number 26. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. And break it. And it says this. And gave it to the disciples and said, take eat. This is my body. Now a Catholic reads that and do you know what they think? They think that bread literally just turned into his body. Now when we read over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, what did it say? About, about us. It said, let me go back real quick so that I don't misquote it. But it said that we all... It said, for we being many are one bread. So why do you pick and choose what you want to take literally? Because that would mean that you're literally bread too, wouldn't it? For we being many are one bread and one body. Referring to your body. For we are all partakers, explaining, of that one bread. It's figurative, my friend. It's figurative in the Bible. It's very, very clear that it is figurative. And when Jesus Christ takes this bread and he hands it around to his disciples, it is figurative. It is, it is a way for us to, communion, uh, to, to commune with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, with the death, to remember and commune and think of his death, reflect upon his death. It symbolizes his death. Now, I'm going to prove this further. If you look at verse number 20, 27, it says this, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Now, what I'm about to show you is the greatest proof that, to debunk this. I've never heard anyone use it, and I don't know why. The very first, one of the first times that I read this, when I only read the Bible for the first time, I noticed this. Look at verse number 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. So what did he just say that the drink that he gave them was? His blood, right? So they say that's literal. Keep reading. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
Watch this, verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. How clear is that? Of this fruit of the vine. So what are they drinking? Wine. Wine. Not alcoholic wine, of course, but they are drinking the fruit of the vine. He tells you, this fruit of the wine. Vine. It should have already been changed. Supposedly, because it happens, they say, when you bless it and it gives it, and this is, and he had already, according to them, here, referred to it as the actual blood of, of himself, right? But then afterwards, he says, I'm not going to drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. How clear is that? Extremely clear. But you know what? Pagan religions have always practiced the drinking of actual blood. The drinking of actual blood. I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter number 33. Ezekiel chapter number 33. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter number 7. Where this is actually a commandment. If Jesus Christ would have been doing that, he would have been transgressing the law of God. If he would have actually given them blood to drink, he would have been breaking God's law. Leviticus chapter number 7 Verse number 26 reads, Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or a beast in any of your dwellings. Whether, wh uh, whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Leviticus chapter number 17, I'll read that to you too. It gives you the reason why you're not supposed to drink blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14 <clears throat> reads, For it is the life of all flesh, referring to the blood. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. None. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Watch this. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And you are trying to convince me that Jesus Christ literally gave his blood to his disciples. It's ridiculous. Right. Now look at what we see here in Ezekiel. I want you to look at Ezekiel chapter number 33. Ezekiel chapter number 33. We see a couple of things present. Like I said, all these things always show up. It's all the same identifiers. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 33, verse number 24. It's when the children of Israel turned against the, you know, the Lord their God, turned away from the Lord their God, and they started practicing paganism like they've done so many times. They, they went to the heathen and Gentile religions. <clears throat> Look at verse number 24. Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us. For inheritance. Watch this. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land. So what are they doing? They're eating with the blood, and they're lifting up their heads toward their idols. You go into a Roman Catholic church, there's idols everywhere. Do you know what that man says that he's giving you? Hey, this is literal blood. Drink it. Paganism has never changed. It's always been the same. There's nothing new under the sun. And the Roman Catholic Church is exactly the same as every other pagan religion that has ever been on this planet. They're all the same. You know what they do? They, they have some sort of priest they call him father. You know what else they do? They worship idols. You know what else they do? Gentiles, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 10, they have a sacrifice, right? And they drink blood. And they eat flesh. They say they're eating flesh and, and drinking blood. I want you to look at something else here. <clears throat> I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 7. With this in mind, connecting these two here, <clears throat> almost all pagan religions put their emphasis on, within the multiplicity of gods on a female deity. Almost all pagan religions. When you look at all pagan religions throughout history... They have a multiplicity of gods, and they emphasize a female deity. Why? Because it's the exact opposite of the truth. That's why. It's the exact opposite of the truth because the one God is a he, and he says repeatedly that he's a he. Now, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church, pagan religion, what do they do? They deify Mary. It's called Mariology. They worship Mary. They make statues and images of Mary, and they worship Mary. <clears throat> I want you to, and, and, and a, a title that they give you, before we read this, a title that they gave, and oh, I forgot that I included this. So this is interesting. I actually just found this a few minutes ago when I was looking this up in my office. Uh, on October 11th, 1954, Pope Pius XII officially designated the official title 
of Mary to be the Queen of Heaven. The Queen of Heaven. They have a statement that they refer to Mary as being the Mother of God. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter number 7. So we saw in Ezekiel, which takes place concurrently with this passage here. Ezekiel, where they are eating, they're eating flesh, they're eating blood, they're worshiping idols. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 18. We're going to look at a passage here, and then we'll go elsewhere as well in just a moment. Uh, verse 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes. So what is this? It's a sacrifice. What is it? It's bread. Notice that. To make cakes. To the queen of heaven. And to pour out, look at this, drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. What's that sound like? Sounds like the devil's table. Sounds like when he says, hey, we have the real communion, but the devil also has his communion. He has his sacrifice. Every time you look it up, what are they doing? They're, they're pagans in the Bible. They're worshiping idols. They have the priests, we saw, that they call father. While they're worshiping idols. What do we see? They're, they're eating flesh. They're drinking blood. They worship. And you know, when I went to the page of, of uh, paganism on Wikipedia, they populated a picture of within the, the Roman Empire. And you know what the picture was? It was a person sacrificing unto a female goddess. If you look up paganism, the majority of times they lift up or exalt a female goddess above the rest. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 44 and see this again. Jeremiah chapter number 44. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 44, verse number 17. Just as the children of Israel started worshiping the golden calf, they got that from a pagan heathen religion uh, in ancient Egypt. We see them here going after pagan gods, worshiping pagan goddesses. Look at Jeremiah 44. Let's begin reading in verse number 17. Let's look at verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. Notice the plurality. And all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. So they just say, we will not listen to you. So notice, it's totally in contradiction with God's word, with the Bible. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. And watch this. To burn incense unto the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven. What did Pope Pius XII say that who Mary was? Queen of heaven. There's a Catholic church where I live in northern Kentucky over off of, I believe it's the street Commonwealth. You know what the name of the Catholic church is? Mary, queen of heaven. Mary, queen of heaven. You know what they do? They say, hey, eat this blood. This is a sacrifice. Look, and you go in, what do you have? Idols everywhere. What were they doing? They're worshiping the queen of heaven. They're eating bread. And look at this. Keep reading. I want you to show you that they have a drink offering that they're taking as well. Uh, queen of heaven, pick up right where we left off, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. We and our father, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. What do they do? They have a drink offering. They have, full, they have bread that they eat, right? <clears throat> and they worship the queen of heaven. The Catholic Church also says that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Why do they do that? Why do they say she's a perpetual virgin? Because they try to teach that she is a goddess. They say that she was sinless. They say that, that Mary never sinned one time in her entire life. They don't believe that anyone else did that. Besides who? Jesus. And who is Jesus? He's what? God. God. Who is the only person that is sinless? Jesus. Or what is he? God. Like you said. So what would that make Mary if she's sinless? She'd be God too. So what, what's the purpose of all of this? You're not trying, you're not tricking anybody here. It's to make her to be a goddess. And give her this title, the queen of heaven. This, who they are worshiping here? The children of Israel, the queen of heaven? Who do they think they're worshiping? What would they say? This is the goddess, wouldn't they? Exact same thing the Catholic Church believes about their church, about, about Mary in their church. They believe that Mary is a goddess. That's what they believe. That, that is they try to deify Mary. Proof that Mary 
was not a perpetual virgin. In Matthew 1.24, the angel uh, appears to Mary and Joseph and says this, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took, uh, took unto him his wife. Verse 25, it says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Notice, he knew her not. He did not have relations with her. He knew her not till, till she brought forth her firstborn son. So, what does that mean? So after she brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus, he did know her. He did have relations with her. But the Bible records that they had other children. Not only that, in Luke chapter number 2, Mary actually goes and, and uh, gives a sacrifice. And what's the reason why they would sacrifice in the Old Testament? What was the purpose or the reason why they did that? Because they had sins to atone for their sins, proving Mary was a sinner. She was a human being just like you and I. You know, she talks about finding favor, grace in God's sight, doesn't she? Why would you need grace if you were sinless? That wouldn't make any sense. Not only that, she says in Luke chapter number 1, I believe, where she says uh, that she rejoices in God, her Savior. She said, I rejoice in God, my Savior. Do you know what you don't need if you're sinless? A Savior. Why would you need it? Why, what's the reason why you need a Savior? Because you're a sinner. You wouldn't need to be saved. You'd have nothing to be saved from. You know, technically, in a sense, which is all hypothetical, but if somebody lived a perfect life and died, where would they go? Heaven. Heaven. You know, Mary wouldn't have needed a Savior. She would just go to he heaven just out of her own goodness. Right? That's all I have for tonight. A couple other things I wanted to look at, but I'm going to cut the, the sermon a little bit shorter. But what I wanted to show you was that there is a, there's a, there is a thread all throughout the Bible, of, of pagan religions that are mentioned, whether it be Babylon, whether it be Egypt, whatever it may be, Israel worshiping, you know, uh, false gods, false goddesses, and there's always these, uh, there's always the same identifiers that, that show up every single time. And when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, all the things that strongly distinguish them from true Christianity, all the differences if you were to walk in a Roman Catholic church and then walk in here, all those differences line up seamlessly with what? Pagan religion. And that's why it's referred to as the Roman Catholic Church. It is a pagan religion. It's not Christianity. And you know what? These things, the, everything that I preach tonight, a lot of it you may have been familiar with. And it needs to be a lot of the soul winning we're doing. You need to be familiar with this. You need to refresh on this. You need to pay attention. Even if you heard it, pay attention and listen. You know why? Because next week you might knock the door of a devout Catholic who actually knows what he believes. And you may have to turn to some of these passages. You're going to remember where all these are. You'll be able to show them, hey, Queen of Heaven is actually a title that's given to a goddess. You know? That, you don't think that that would shock most, cat, most Catholics that really never thought of that? The Israelites were worshiping a false god and her name was the Queen of Heaven. What do you guys call Mary? The Queen of Heaven? That's weird. You know what they were doing? You know, the Bible commands not to eat any flesh, you know, with the blood. The Bible commands you not to, not to eat blood over and over again. Hey, look here. He actually says that they were drinking wine. He says that he's not going to drink of the fruit of this vine. He's not giving them their literal blood. You have to be out of your mind in the first place to think he's breaking his body apart. Well, I don't know what they think, but that's insane. It's craziness, right? They believe he's, he's, he's doing some sort of, you know, uh, miracle and, and, and changing it into. That's nonsense. It's paganism. We need to be firmed up on these things. And you need to remember these things when you bump into the Catholics out soul winning. There's 1.3 billion of them in the world. We knock their doors all the time, and sometimes you, you knock the door of a devout Catholic. You need to be able to show them these things in love and kindly show them, hey, you're not in true Christianity, man. What you believe is not, it's not the you know, biblical Christianity. It's not the true religion. Right. Let me show you how Catholicism actually contradicts the Bible. Show them these things. It's important. We need to you know, be equipped to go out and do work. It's not just head knowledge, right? These things need to be refreshed, and we need to use it when we go out. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the, the, all of the, the warnings, all of the, the, the exact phrases that are recorded in the Bible, the Queen of Heaven. So when we see a pagan religion, uh, it's just so easy to spot, dear Lord. It's uh, verbatim. We, we love you and we thank you that you've warned us over these things. We thank you, dear God, for uh, the gospel and for Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Uh, we thank you that the Bible isn't just uh, a contradicting mess where you tell us not to eat blood and then in the New Testament we eat blood. We just thank you for just the clarity of the Bible. We thank you that, 
that uh, uh, the religion that we subscribe to, dear Lord, uh, is, is a religion that's not of confusion. We ask you that we go out and, and, and give us clarity of mind in these things and that we can share these things uh, with others that, that, that have been mixed up in this false religion and we can just show them, dear God, that, uh, that, that the true religion is found just in the Bible, just straight in the Bible, and that it's just by grace through faith and preaching them the, the true gospel. Help us to care for people, dear God, and help these, these false religions. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.